Hello guys, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Faraz Ahmad. So our next video is regarding the GIT gastroenterology and in this video we are going to discuss about the important points, important topic which can come in the PLEB1 exam as your MCQs. So first of all we are going to uh, you know cover about the differentials of the liver disease. We will discuss about the primary biliary cirrhosis, we will discuss about the sclerosing cholangitis, autoimmune hepatitis, alcoholic liver disease and the drug induced hepatitis. So first of all I am going to let you know about the key points then we will discuss these in the details as well so basically primary biliary cirrhosis you have to keep these things in your mind middle aged female pruritus gendus increase alp and this is associated with a jocrine syndrome and you have to see about the anti-microchondrial antibodies as well in the primary biliary cirrhosis so please keep in mind association is with the Jogren syndrome in primary biliary cirrhosis. So how you can differentiate primary biliary cirrhosis with the primary sclerosing cholangitis? Please keep in mind you have to keep the association in your mind. This is cholangitis. This is gitis. This is infection or the inflammation. So you have to keep ulcerative colitis in your mind. Ulcerative colitis is associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis. Autoimmune hepatitis. What does it mean? Any female or male patient with abnormal liver function test and with the history of some ongoing autoimmune disease for example diabetes mellitus hypothyroidism vitiligo if any of these so you have to click on the autoimmune hepatitis so alcoholic liver disease this is very very important there may be the you know history of the heavy alcohol consumption and patient will be presenting with derangement in the liver function test so in alcoholic liver disease you have to note you have to note what you have to keep in your mind like ast and alt will be raised but ast will be double the value of the alt double value of the ast as compared to alt and positive ggt is related to alcoholic liver disease apart from this we can talk about the acute viral hepatitis as well so in acute viral hepatitis what will happen there will be the history of the viral infection there may be the history of the you know hepatitis a or b fico oral root transmission like the dietary or the water intake and then alt ast will be in thousands so the other in uh, other condition that is called as the drug induced hepatitis in this hepatitis alt ast could be in thousands as well but in the history in the scenario there will be the history of the treatment with some ongoing antibiotics for example coemoxiclave there may be the history of the clavulonic acid uh, you know there may be the history of the other antibiotic consumption but when you will see at the level of what when you will see at the level of the liver function enzyme they will be in the thousands so let's go from the start and now i will let you know about these conditions so I will let you know about these conditions one by one in detail but before this what I am going to do is I am going to start with the celiac disease. So please keep in mind everyone know this is autoimmune disease and this is basically sensitivity to the gluten. So you have to keep in your mind the gluten rich diets which include the wheat, ray and the barley and what happened in the celiac disease because of the hypersensitivity to these diets there may be the villus hypertrophy in the GIT. Villus hypertrophy is basically villi are responsible for the reabsorption absorption so it can lead to malabsorption because of the malabsorption it can lead to iron deficiency anemia folic acid vitamin b12 deficiency and malabsorption of the fat as well so because of all these malabsorption what can happen clinical manifestation could be diarrhea chronic or the intermittent diarrhea there may be the you know stools rich in the fat the patient will say that it's very difficult to flush you know and apart from this what patient can complain of the very bad smell of the stools there may be the abdominal discomfort bloating nausea or vomiting and patient can also complain of the weight loss iron deficiency anemia folate b12 deficiency anemia you can see on the bloods so what will happen so apart from this uh, celiac disease can cause a complication the most important complication is osteoporosis but sometime it can sell it can cause the t-cell lymphoma as well so please don't forget the association of the celiac disease it may be associated with other autoimmune diseases for example hypothyroidism uh, vitiligo or the type 1 diabetes mellitus are but important association is dermatitis hepatiformis so diagnosis first of all you have to look for the first line investigations you have to look for the 
tissue transglutaminase antibody and the IgA okay apart from this what you have to do if TTG is positive we need to confirm the diagnosis of the celiac disease by duodenal or duodenal biopsy so in the biopsy what you will see there will be the villus atrophy crypt hyperplasia and increased interhepithelial lymphocytes so what is the treatment of the celiac disease the celiac disease treatment is only and only gluten free diet Let's discuss about the Barrett esophagus. You must be knowing about it like that if some patient is known to have the GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disorder, then what happened? The lower esophagus is getting exposed to the acid of the stomach repeatedly. So what can happen? The lower esophagus squamous cell epithelium can be changed into the clonal epithelium with goblet cells. So this metaplasia of the lower esophagus can lead to Barrett esophagus and Barrett esophagus can lead to the adenocarcinoma of the lower one third of the esophagus. Please keep in mind if there is carcinoma in the lower one third of the esophagus it will be adenocarcinoma. If there is carcinoma in the upper two-third of the esophagus it will be squamous cell carcinoma and this could be related to ecclesia. So let's discuss about the ecclesia. Basically this is inability to relax the lower esophageal sphincter due to any reason. Due to any reason if lower esophageal sphincter is unable to relax what will happen whatever you are taking either solid or liquid please keep in mind either solid or liquid it's not gonna dump into the stomach so what will happen this condition will be called as the ecclesia please keep in mind if inability to swallow liquids this is straight away ecclesia so what will happen patient will develop the dysphagia to both and solids and the liquids so apart from this this patient these patient with ecclesia they will you know develop the regurgitation as well because food is not going in the stomach so this food will be regurgitated so because of the regurgitation these patient can aspirate something into the stomach and because of this reason they develop the repeated repeated what they develop repeated episode of the chest infection and the pneumonia so please keep in mind what you will do you will do the chest x-ray on the chest x-ray you will see what you will see the mega esophagus but what is gold standard what is the most appropriate test that is the barium meal and you will see the bird beak appearance on the barium meal and so what you have to do you have to Myered. what is the most accurate test is esophageal monometry and esophageal monometry will show the increased lower esophageal sphincter pressure so you have to treat this condition which is called as the ecclesia and the treatment is dilatation of the lower esophageal sphincter and you will dilate this sphincter surgically so let's do an mcqs 45 year old woman present with the productive cuff and the moderate fever so scenario is saying productive cough and the moderate fever and you will start thinking about the respiratory system she also complained of the central chest pain regurgitation of the undigested food and the dysphagia to both solids and the liquids so please keep in mind dysphagia to liquid please keep in mind ecclesia so what is the diagnosis diagnosis ecclesia and what you will see on the chest x-ray mega esophagus so two very very important conditions which can affect the GIT are called the Crohn disease and the ulcerative colitis. These are basically the inflammatory bowel disease and what you have to do you have to keep the differentiating point in your mind. So Crohn disease start with the C. We are going to discuss we are going to put Crohn disease first and the ulcerative colitis start with the U. So please keep in mind both condition both in both condition patient will be presenting with the diarrhea but in Crohn disease the diarrhea will be watery not bloody diarrhea and in ulcerative colitis patient will be presenting with the bloody diarrhea and please keep in mind Crohn disease can affect your GIT from your mouth to anus but most of the time Crohn disease is going to affect where Crohn disease is going to affect in the right iliac fossa region what does it mean it's mean it's going to affect the cecum and the ascending colon this is the Crohn disease while your ulcerative colitis will be affecting what it will be affecting your left iliac so sorry uh, left I like fossa yes L I F it will be affecting your sigmoid colon and the descending colon so what can happen apart from this presentation patient can develop pain in both conditions like in the Crohn disease pain in the RIF right iliac fossa and the left lower abdomen in the ulcerative colitis so this is the presentation along with this what is the association of these conditions like Crohn disease is associated with fistulae and the perianal fistulas peri 
anal fistulas. As I told you, Crohn's disease is going to affect your GIT from mouth to anus. Peri anal fistula is associated with Crohn's disease. But what you have to do, as I told you previously, ulcerative colitis is associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is association of ulcerative colitis. So what you will do, you can check, you can do the endoscopy in Crohn's disease and in the endoscopy you will get some findings that are the skiplian, transmural or the deep ulcers and the cobblestone appearance. Keep in mind skiplian and Crohn's disease. Transmural ulcers and the cobbled stone appearance, these are the features of the Crohn's disease. Apart from this, what you will see on the histology in the Crohn's disease is granulomas and the increased goblet cells. While on the other hand, in the ulcerative colitis, on the histology, you will see the crypt abscesses decrease goblet cells. Granuloma and increased goblet cells, Crohn's disease. Crypt abscesses and decreased goblet cells, this is ulcerative colitis. Okay, apart from this, guys, what you will do and yeah, the important, another important thing is that, another important thing is that, as I told you in the Crohn's disease, you will do endoscopy, it will show the skiplian and the transmural or the deep ulcer with the cobblestone appearance, but in the ulcerative colitis, you will do barium enema that will show you the loss of hostrations in the, you know, bowel and the, if there is a no hostrations in the bowel, it will give the appearance of the drain pipe, just a straight pipe like appearance. You can Google it, you can see on the, you know, x-ray findings. So apart from these guys and other important thing, both condition can present with the weight loss ulcerative colitis crohn disease both can present with a weight loss the aphthous ulcer are very very important both condition can have the aphthous ulcer but most of the time aphthous ulcers are the common in the crohn disease and other important thing is related to smoking so ulcerative colitis and the crohn disease so ulcerative colitis is affecting the distal part of the intestine please keep in mind uh, i have remembered this point like smoking is not going distally so smoking is are, you know so smoking is going to decrease the risk of the ulcerative colitis while smoking increase the risk of the crohn disease so apart from this one other important thing we let me repeat it crohn disease what you will see cobblestone appearance and the deep ulcer and the skiplian and apart from this on the bowel enema in the crohn disease you will see the cantor string appearances and the thorn ulcer and the fistula as i told you so ulcerative colitis you are seeing the loss of frustrations and it will give the drain pipe appearance another important thing related to the management in if there is no preferred option in the you know uh, in the mcqs you can select prednisolone you can select mesalazine you can select hydrocortisone prednisolone for any of them but if they are going to ask specifically in crohn disease you have to pick oral prednisolone first line to induce a remission okay in Crohn disease first line to induce a remission is oral prednisolone while in ulcerative colitis first line to induce a remission is uh, mesalazine okay but keep in mind if there is severe ulcerative colitis exacerbation then you have to click the option of the IV hydrocortisone so prednisolone in Crohn disease IV hydrocortisone in ulcerative colitis and to induce a remission in ulcerative colitis is 5 amino salicylic acid that is mesalazine. Another important thing along with the ecclesia is the zincar diverticulum that is basically a pharyngeal pouch. So patient will be presenting with the dysphagia and patient will state that doctor when I am going to eat food so I develop bad smell. Bad smelling and regurgitation of the fluid presentation with the chronic cuffs so patient will be complaining of these and what you will suspect pharyngeal pouch and you have to do what you can do x-ray as well but the important diagnosis is important test is barium swallow when you will do the barium swallow it will show you these type of things so in the other way mcqs can also state that the gurgling sound in the chest when drinking is an important sign of the pharyngeal pouch gurgling sound repeated chest infection bad smell after taking the food is the diagnosis of the pharyngeal pouch that is also called as a zincar diverticulum so if you want i can repeat the causes of the hypokalemia and hyperkalemia for you so the causes of hypokalemia include the loop diuretics and the thiazide like diuretics loop diuretic include the furosemide bendoflumi thiazide in the thiazide diure like diuretic so vomiting and diarrhea cause the hypokalemia villus adenoma can cause renal tubular failure cushing syndrome and the cone disease 
please keep in mind cushing and cone cushing and cone causes the hypokalemia apart from that important causes of the hyperkalemia include the ace inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers both can cause the hyperkalemia potassium sparing diuretics pyrolactone ckd and addison disease Cushing syndrome and the Crohn disease causing hypokalemia and Addison's disease is going to cause the hyperkalemia. So let's talk about the vitamin B12 deficiency. So most important cause, important factor, important cause of the vitamin B12 deficiency is pernicious anemia. Basically, this is autoimmune atrophy of the gastric mucosa. Because of this atrophy, loss of the intrinsic factor happen and these factors are required to, re to absorb the vitamin B12. So what is going to happen if you are going to happen this type of the deficiency of the vitamin, uh, sorry, intrinsic factor, you will develop the vitamin B12 deficiency. Other causes include the total gastrectomy, ILD section, Crohn disease and the chronic pancreatitis and celiac disease as well. So there may be the dietary deficiency as well but dietary deficiency take time to develop. So remember that the vitamin B12 is present in the meat, fish and the dairy products. So if someone is not taking meat, fish, so what does it mean that is vegetarian, that patient, that patient is taking vegetarian diet. If someone is saying I am vegan and often develop vitamin b12 deficiency please keep in mind vegetarian develop vitamin b12 deficiency so what will be the feature of the vitamin b12 deficiency please keep in mind vitamin b12 can lead to anemia there may be the features of the anemia like shortness of breath and the fatigue and patient can develop peripheral paresthesia impaired position and the vibration sensation peripheral paresthesia mean patient can develop the numbness in the hands and the feet and apart from this impaired position and the vibration proprioception sense will be affected in these patient patient can develop ataxia dementia as well so when you will do the lab mcv will be increased because vitamin b12 deficiency anemia is the macro macrocytic anemia and when you will do the blood film you can see the hyper segmented neutrophil will be there along with the low hemoglobin hyper segmented neutrophil is the feature of the vitamin b12 deficiency okay guys so what you have to do you have to treat this patient by the i am hydroxycobalamin you will give this patient the injection of the uh, hydroxycobalamin so let's repeat again regarding the ulcerative colitis a patient is known to have the ulcerative colitis coming with the frequency uh, of diarrhea more than six times and there is blood in these diarrhea so patient is having the tachycardia more than 100 and the temperature is 38.5 abdomen is also tender so what does it mean it is basically the flare up or the exacerbation of the ulcerative colitis as i told you in the flare up of the ulcerative colitis what you are going to do you will treat this patient with the iv hydrocortisone so there is a rule of 630 and 90 630 and 90 you have have to keep in your mind if more than six uh, bowel movements are the more than six episodes of the diarrhea with the blood and the ESR more than 30 and the heart rate is more than 90 this is confirmation of the exacerbation or the flare up of the ulcerative colitis. So initially in the start of this video as I told you about the uh, condition which affect the liver so first condition was the autoimmune hepatitis so I told you that the abnormal LFTs secondary amenorrhea any female patient presenting with these problems and if there is association of the any of the autoimmune disease including what including vitiligo, Edison disease, thyroid disease, hypothyroidism, diabetes mellitus. So what you have to click, you have to click on the option of the autoimmune hepatitis. So then I told you about the al uh, alcoholic liver disease. Sorry, I told you about the alcoholic liver disease. I told you that there will be the history of the uh, heavy alcohol consumption and patient will be presenting with the SITs, hematemesis, jaundice, hepatomegaly and the other features of the chronic liver disease. But when you will do the bloods, you will find that the AST is double the value of the ALT. If AST is going to double the value of the ALT, this is alcoholic liver disease. And in these patients, GGT will also be positive. So what you have to do, you have to ask this patient to stop the alcohol and consider the liver transplant after six months of the alcohol stoppage. So acute cholecystitis is basically information of the you know gallbladder. It could be main reason. Main reason is the gallstone. So basically, acute severe right upper right upper quadrant pain or the epigastric pain that may radiate to the back or to the right flank or it may go to the right shoulder as well. So 
this pain may be precipitated or the increase by taking the meal patient can present with the nausea vomiting and the fever as well so another important thing if patient is developing the genders what does it mean these these stones gall stones are obstructing the common bile duct normally normally there will be no genders in the acute cholecystitis secondary to the gall stone but if there is genders that mean that the patient is having the cholecystitis obstruction of the common bile duct secondary to the stone so how you can check the acute cholecystitis you can do the murphy sign you have to press the patient right coastal margin in the mid clavicular line and you have to ask the patient to take a deep breath in and patient will stop breathing because it's so painful condition when you will do the blood there will be the derangement of the lfts inflammatory markers will also be raised wbcs and the crp and when you will check the blood so all the things will be going in the favor of the infection patient is signing the murphy positive and patient is you know presenting with right upper quadrant pain and vomiting and the nausea so what does it mean this is direct acute cholecystitis so you have to keep 5f in your mind that mean white people fair white people fatty female fertile and 40 so what does it mean fertile and 40 so it's mean this condition is also very very common during the pregnancy or right after the pregnancy as well so investigation wise you have to do white cell count and the other bloods and there is an other important MCQs that state like what will you do? Will you do chest x-ray? Will you do ultrasound? Will you do CT? So please keep in mind as I told you, uh, it is easy to remember as I told you uh, like this condition acute cholecystitis is also very common during the pregnancy. During pregnancy we can't do x-ray, we can't do CT. So what you have to select, either patient is pregnant or not, you have to select the ultrasound of the abdomen. So what you will do, how you will treat this patient, you will uh, keep patient nilper or you have to give analgesia IV, IV fluid, IV antibiotic and the other important option is in our country we do like normally we do the delayed cholecystectomy but in the England, in the United Kingdom, nice recommend that you have to do the early laparoscopic cholecystectomy within one week of the diagnosis of the acute cholecystitis. So this is the important point and these points come in the MCQs. So let me tell you two MCQs. This is very, very important, like how you can, uh, you know, differentiate in the adults and the young people. So an elderly man, 78 year old, presented with the history of the progressive dysphagia to solids and now to liquids with a history of weight loss and with the history of Barrett esophagus so what you are gonna thinking about you are gonna thinking about the esophageal cancer this is the cancer of the lower esophagus adenocarcinoma but if there is young person or the elderly person presenting with persistent dysphagia to both solids and the liquid now dysphagia is to both solids and the liquids there is no history of the weight loss, no history of the regurgitation, there is history of NSAIDs use, there is history of the bisphosphonate intake in your MCQ. So what you will think? So please keep in mind these NSAIDs, these bisphosphonate, alendronate, these can cause the constriction, these can make the strictures in the lower esophagus. So you have to select the option of the benign esophageal stricture. Please keep in mind in elderly patient, Presenting with the progressive dysphagia, weight loss, you have to think about the esophageal cancer. But if patient is presenting without weight loss and patient is presenting with the history of the NSAIDs intake and the bisphosphonate intake, you have to think about the benign esophageal stricture. And when you think about the regurgitation, you have to keep two conditions in your mind. First condition is called the ecclesia. In ecclesia, you have to keep in your mind like patient is not even able to intake liquids. And in the second condition, which can cause the regurgitation, this is the pharyngeal pouch. Patient will be complaining of the regurgitation and patient will be complaining of the gurgling sound after the intake and halitosis. That means the very bad smell from the food pipe. So let's discuss about another important condition which we called as acute pancreatitis. So what are the main risk factors given in your MCQs? Gallstone and alcoholism are the main risk factor in the United Kingdom. Apart from this, trauma and the ERCP are the other risk factor. So how patient will present? Patient will be presenting with the upper abdominal pain 
what does it mean central are the epigastric abdominal pain radiating to back and the relief by the sitting forward are the leaning forward patient will say my uh, i am having the pain in my epigastrium it's going to back or it's going to between the my shoulders blade but when i am going to sit forward this pain is going to relieve please keep in mind you have to differentiate it patient can complain of the epigastric pain going between the shoulder blades so this could be what this could be as aortic dissection but in aortic dissection pain will not remove by leaning forward and in aortic dissection there will be the uh, you know blood pressure difference in the both arms as well so patient complaining of the epigastric pain going to back or going to between the shoulder blades and pain is getting better leaning forward complaining of the nausea vomiting and complaining of the fever as well so there may be tenderness there may be tachycardia patient can be in the shock as well apart from this you have to look for the two signs there may be the bruising of the discoloration around the umbilicus this sign is called the Cullen sign and there is another sign which we call as a gray turner sign there may be the discoloration in the flanks as well so apart from this patient could be generous as well so what you have to do you have to do the investigation so initial investigation is lipase and the amylase please keep in mind lipase is being conducted in the nhs and lipase is the more specific and the sensitive in my hospital there is no amylase available they always do lipase okay so increase serum lipase more than the three times the upper limit of the normal so to confirm the you know diagnosis what we do we do the ct abdomen with contrast ct abdomen with contrast is the investigation to confirm the diagnosis if your lipase is coming high okay so what you have to do how you have to manage the patient what you will do initial steps what you have to do fluid resuscitation you have to give the iv analgesia you have to give the nutritional support and after this you have to give the iv antibiotic but if problem is not going to resolve you can do the surgical debridement as well so apart from this let's discuss about the acute cholangitis ascending cholangitis so cholangitis mean there is some infection or the inflammation ascending cholangitis basically this is is the infection or the inflammation of the you know biliary tract or the biliary canal so please keep in mind the charcoal striate charcoal striate this triad is fever right upper quadrant pain and the jaundice fever right upper quadrant pain genders this is acute cholangitis picture apart from this patient can be in hypotension and leukocytosis as well so what is the diagnosis for biliary system for the gallbladder you have to do the ultrasound and the blood ultrasound and apart from this you can do the culture as well management is same iv fluid broad spectrum antibiotics and the any coagulopathy you have to treat so what you have to do if there is inflammation secondary to what secondary to the stone you have to do the ercp to relieve the cause so let's discuss about the organism which can cause the diarrhea in you which can cause the diarrhea in the patient it could be the bloody diarrhea or the watery diarrhea so first of all let's discuss about the organism which can cause the bloody diarrhea so you have to keep one mnemonic in your mind like bloody diarrhea doesn't look sexy but here the sexy spelling is little different you have to keep the spellings of the sexy s e c s y s stand for salmonella e for e coli c for compylobacter h for shigella and y for your senior pastil so you have to keep this mnemonic in your mind so let's discuss about the e coli basically basically this causes the traveler diarrhea this could be the bloody as well usually the short period of the time and this diarrhea self-limited within 72 hours and please keep in mind this patient can travel this patient can have a travel history to africa so if some patient is traveling in the europe and patient is coming with the watery diarrhea please keep in mind this diarrhea is not bloody and patient is coming with the water oh, sorry weight loss and these symptoms are are still there more than 10 days so you have to keep this giardia in your mind so giardiasis is basically going to give you the very long symptoms more than the 10 days so compelobacter jejuni history of the travel high grade fever headache and there could be the myalgia and there could be the bloody diarrhea as well so please keep in mind history of travel patient is coming with the bloody diarrhea and patient is coming with the arthritis you have to choose the option of the compelobacter jejuni 
okay so apart from this as i told you earlier traveler diarrhea with e coli so diarrhea in the pediatrics most of the time diarrhea in the pediatrics is related to rotavirus if you are admitted in the hospital and you develop acute gastroenteritis over there so gastroenteritis acute gastroenteritis in the hospital without taking the antibiotics is because of norovirus so if you have developed diarrhea and weakness a weakness in your legs and the arms and a reflex here please keep in mind the gulian berry syndrome diarrhea plus renal impairment and hemolysis hemolytic uremic syndrome and if you develop diarrhea after having the camping and now you are having the pain in the right upper quadrant so you have to think about the and ameba histolytica so another important thing is that if you have developed diarrhea after taking the long term course for example more than 7 day course of the antibiotic you have to think about the clostridium difficile pseudomembranous colitis and the for the treatment you have to give oral metronidazole and the oral vancomycin diarrhea after taking the eggs and the chicken eggs and chicken this is important salmonella salmonella is related to eggs and chicken okay and if you are developing diarrhea right after the few hours of taking the meal staph aureus toxin so staph toxins are related to staph toxins are related to diarrhea right after few hours of the food intake okay so if you are developing diarrhea in a bedridden patient which is handicapped as well can't move stay on the bed with the stony hard stool on the dre so this is basically because of the overflow diarrhea this is due to the fecal impaction so please keep in mind a mass has been removed from the cecum right side the histopathology report confirmed the transmural infiltration with the lymphocytes so what are you gonna uh, you know think about this is basically basically crohn disease as i told you crohn disease most of the time affect the right side of the abdomen this affect the cecum and the ascending colon and there are the transmural uh, you know deep ulcers and the granulomas as well so this is crohn disease so for the primary biliary cirrhosis as i told you previously let's talk in the details here you have to complete you have to keep three m's in your mind one m go to middle aged female one m go to igm and the third m goes to anti microcordial antibody so patient will present with the pruritus you know skin uh, manifestations increase alp jaundice and association will be the jogren syndrome so please think about the primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosis and cholangitis as i told you you have to you know correlate with the ulcerative colitis patient can present with the features like pruritus jaundice increase alp feature similar to the primary biliary cirrhosis and there is no mentioning of the anti microcorbial antibody and there is mentioning of the ulcerative colitis you have to go for the primary sclerosis and cholangitis and you have to diagnose primary sclerosis and cholangitis via via ercp and to diagnose the primary biliary cirrhosis you should have anti microcordial antibodies positive so let me quickly tell you the few things as well if some patient is developing coming with the cirrhosis of the liver with the you know ascites so what you have to do for the symptomatic relief you have to drain the ascites and what you have to do you have to send the culture of the acetic fluid and you have to start patient on the spironolactone and the albumin infusion so in the celiac disease you have to keep the complications the most important complication is osteoporosis and the second which is very rare is the t cell lymphoma and association don't forget the uh, dermat arthritis hypertiformis another important thing which i am going to mention about you which i am going to mention to you is the you have to keep the air under diaphragm in your mind so whatever the perforation wherever the perforation is in the tummy it can lead to the you know air under diaphragm if there is any features coming of the air under diaphragm in the exam you have to think about the perforation of the organ and you have to click on the organ like perforation of the peptic ulcer perforation of the small intestine as per the presentation of your case so let's discuss about the h pylori management so this management is little bit different so any patient coming with dyspepsia and age is less than 55 year old what you have to do you have to first of all uh, you know modify the lifestyle and you have to prescribe the antacid medication if no improvement what you have to do you have to do the h pylori serum antibody test if this test is coming back negative then you have to give the ppi or h2 blocker for the 4 weeks and you have to review the patient 
on the review if patient is improved no further action is needed but on the review if no improvement in the patient's symptoms what you have to do you have to select the option of the upper gi endoscopy so patient coming with the dyspepsia you did the h pylori uh, you know serum antibody test it came back negative you give ppi no improvement go for the upper gi endoscopy so patient is coming with the dyspepsia and you did h polarized serum antibody test that came back positive so what you did you you know give the patient the eradication of the h pylori triple therapy that include the ppi that include the amoxicillin and the clarithromycin for one to two weeks and then you review the patient in four weeks so patient symptom improve no need to do anything else so if after having the positive serum antibody test, after having the eradication therapy of the H. pylori, patient symptoms are still not improved, then what you have to do? You have to do the carbon-13 urea breath test. If that is coming back the positive, then you have to give an other eradication therapy of the H. pylori. But if it's coming back the negative, then you have to do the upper GI endoscopy to get an idea why this patient is developing the dyspepsia. So now we are going to discuss about the three syndrome. The first one is Mallory syndrome. Third, one, second one is Plumer Vinson syndrome, and the third one is called as the Zollinger Ellison syndrome. So the first one is called the Mallory syndrome. Basically, Mallory syndrome happen after the excessive alcohol intake. After having the excessive alcohol intake, patient develop you know repeated vomiting. Due to repeated bouts of the vomiting, patient develop tear in the lower esophagus, and because of the tear in the lower esophagus, patient start you know vomiting blood so this is basically called as the Mallory V syndrome so Zollinger Ellison syndrome is basically this is the tumor this is the tumor as you know you know gastric mucosa cells they can transfer they can grow in the different areas normally gastric mucosa cells which produce acid they are present in the stomach but if these cells grow in the duodenum and the pancreas, so what will happen? These cells will produce a lot of acid and the acid produced from the duodenum and the pancreas will not be treated by giving the antacids. So these patients will be presenting with the symptoms of the increased acid secretions and not responding to the antacid medications. So what you have to do because these patients are having the multiple source of the production of the, you know, uh, HCL, hydrochloric acid, that is stomach acid acid from the gastrin cells so what will happen gastrinomas basically these are the tumors as i told you excessive amount of the gastrin which stimulate the parietal cells of the stomach to release the more and the more hydrochloric acid at the multiple locations which is present in the duodenum and the pancreas so multiple ulcers will happen resistant to the treatment and the ulcers are basically on the unusual sites Ulcers could be in esophagus, ulcer could be in the duodenum, duodenum as well. If some patient is presenting with these symptoms, not responding to the, you know, antacid therapy, what you have to do, you have to go for the fasting gastrin level or you have to go for the secretin stimulant test. So the third syndrome is plumer vinson syndrome what do you have to, what you have to keep in your mind is if any patient presenting with the painless dysphagia and on the blood patient is showing the iron deficiency anemia then you have to think about the plumer vinson syndrome so this is basically a triage of the dysphagia iron deficiency anemia with the esophageal web you have to think about the plumer vinson syndrome so another triad which you have to keep in your mind, patient developing, patient presenting with hepatomegaly, patient is having diabetes and there is bronze skin, that means the shiny skin. Hepatomegaly, diabetes, bronze skin, you have to keep in your mind the hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis basically, basically the accumulation of the iron or the deposition of the iron in different organs. If hemoglobin is going to deposit in the liver, it will cause the hepatomegaly and it can cause the hepatoma as well. If it's going to deposit in the bank it can cause the diabetes mellitus in the skin it can cause the bronze skins in the joint it can cause the arthropathy or the arthritis if it is going to deposit in the heart it can cause the arrhythmia cardiomyopathy murmur and the shortness of breath as well so what you have to keep you have to keep three points in your mind if patient presenting with hepatomegaly patient presenting with type 1 diabetes mellitus patient presenting with the bronze skin patient presenting with shortness of breath or the arthritis keep in mind keep in mind hemochromatosis the most likely organ to get the cancer in the hemochromatosis because of the deposition of the iron is liver 
Let's discuss another important topic in the form of the MCQs. A 52-year-old male coming to the a and &E with a severe crushing retrosternal chest pain that started when he was trying to drink a cold drink from the ASTA. Okay, and this problem, this symptom started after two hours of taking the, this cold drink from the ASDA. He is giving the sublingual nitroglycerin and fortunately pain get okay. ECG was done which showed the normal sinusism. Cardiac enzymes came back normal. So what it could be, this is a pain, retrosternal chest pain, you know, relieved by giving the nitroglycerin, giving the GTN. So what does it mean? So any pain, retrosternal, improved by the nitroglycerin, and started after taking the cold water ecg and the heart enzymes are coming back normal you have to think about the esophageal spasm sometimes this is the esophageal spasm sometimes what can happen esophagus can go into the spasm because of the reaction to the cold water because of the sensitivity so what you will do when you will do the barium enema barium meal barium meal test is the diagnostic test for the esophageal spasm so you will see the corkscrew appearance of the esophagus and then you have to do what is the most accurate test monometric studies of the esophagus so high intensity this organized contraction will be there so how you can treat as i told you the treatment include the nitro sorry treatment include the nitrates that is gtn and treatment also include the calcium channel blocker that is nifedipine as well so please keep in mind corkscrew appearance okay and spasm are the pain in the chest after taking the you know cold liquids and pain is going to improve after giving the nitrites or the gtn keep in mind the you know what esophageal spasm or the diffuse esophageal spasm we discussed recently about the hemochromatosis so what could be the difference between the hemochromatosis and the hemosidrosis so the difference you can you can see on the liver biopsy so in the liver biopsy if iron pigments iron is getting pigmentation in the hepatocyte this is hemochromatosis if iron is getting deposit iron getting pigmentation in the kupfer cells this is hemosidrosis so we have discussed about the diarrhea in detail. Let's discuss about the constipation as well. So an elderly woman residing in the nursing care home complains of the five day five days diarrhea. She is on the analgesics for her osteoarthritis and the back pain. Rectal examination revealed the impacted stool. So this is basically overflow diarrhea, but there is impaction of the stool. So what you are gonna do is you are gonna do the phosphate enema so please keep in mind how you can manage the constipation if stools are impacted stools are impacted go for the phosphate enema hard stool but not impacted you have to give the stool softener and if the constipation with the soft stool high fiber diet constipation with soft stool what does it mean patient has not passed stool for more than three days what does it mean constipation is basically less than less than two movements of the bowel in a week so if patient is not going to open the bowel more than three days what you have to go you have to go for the constipation with the soft stool and you have to give high fiber that mean you have to give Sina. this is a drug and this is a stimulant laxative this is the first line apart from this if someone is pregnant and pregnant lady is going to develop the constipation so the lactulose is the first line first line treatment so basically we will discuss this topic in detail in the gynae but keep in mind keep in mind if in the pregnancy someone is pregnant so the low hemoglobin level or the anemia is in the first trimester if hb is less than 11 hb is less than 110 in the second and third trimester if hb if hemoglobin is less than 10.5 it is what it is basically low hemoglobin postpartum if hb is less than less than 10 it is called as the anemia so please keep in mind these two syndrome gilbert syndrome and the gullion berries sorry gilbert syndrome and the dobin johnson syndrome so gilbert syndrome is most of the time coming into your exam a patient presenting to the hospital for a routine checkup and unfortunately there is increase in the level of the bilirubin all other blood tests all other liver enzymes are normal patient is not complaining of the any other thing you have to keep gilbert syndrome in your mind so if only bilirubin is raised and if you will do the you know uh, further classification or the further testing of the bilirubin you will see that the unconjugated bilirubin is raised and this is called as the gilbert syndrome no other blood test is abnormal or the 
no other presentation of the patient so how you will differentiate the gilbert syndrome which is basically unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia from the dobin johnson syndrome please keep in mind dobin johnson syndrome is basically basically increase in the level of the conjugated hemoglobin as compared to the gilbert syndrome which is the increased level of the unconjugated bilirubin and in the dobin johnson syndrome urine dipstick test is also normal also abnormal another important mcqs a 26 year old patient coming to the ane with a severe pain on the defecation in the anus it's very tender to touch and when you examine the anus there is a reddish blue sized you know swelling over there near the anus so what is this this is basically perianal hematoma in the hemorrhoids they are not painful so how you can differentiate hemorrhoids from the perianal hematoma in hemorrhoids the hemorrhoids are not painful unless infected and the thrombose so there is usually a short sort of bleeding history such as the blood on the tissue when the wiping in addition hemorrhoids are within the anus not near in or around it so any swelling that is painful very painful and it's a pea sized and when you do the examination reddish blue out of the anus please think about perianal hematoma and you have to reassure the patient you have to give the patient painkillers very good painkiller because this hematoma is going to resolve in few days by its own so another important mcqs is 65 year old man coming to the a and me with easy fatigability and on the examination you have seen left supraclavicular lump and there is also weight loss so what you have to think you have to think about the gastric cancer please keep in mind if there is left supraclavicular mass this is called as a virtuous node you have to look you have to think for the gastric cancer and this sign is called as the trouser sign okay so if there is right supraclavicular mass this can happen in three conditions you have to keep these three conditions in your mind so esophageal cancer lung cancer and the hodgkin lymphoma esophageal cancer lung cancer hodgkin lymphoma right supraclavicular mass and what happened in the left supraclavicular mass this is related to gastric cancer so let's discuss about the few of the differential diagnosis of the dysphagia so if someone is coming elderly patient coming with a progressive what progressive dysphagia initially to solids and now to the liquids with the weight loss and the history of the barrett esophagus or the GERD, you have to think about the esophageal cancer but if some young patient is coming with what some young patient is coming with the you know uh, with the dysphagia to both solids and the liquids and giving the history of the bisphosphonate or the NSAIDs used you have to think about what stricture of the lower end of the esophagus so if someone is presenting with low immunity what does it mean hiv patient or patient with the type 1 diabetes patient is presenting with dysphagia and adenophagia so what you have to think about you have to think about the esophageal candidiasis so if someone is presenting with the dysphagia to both solids and the liquids dysphagia to both solids and the liquid and patient is unable to do patient is unable to eat properly and patient is complaining of the repeated chest infection and the regurgitation you have to think about the ecclesia okay and apart from this if patient is presenting with dysphagia to solids and apart from this patient is complaining like i can start eating properly but i cannot proceed with the eating so you have to think about the pharyngeal pouch and patient will also complain of the gurgling sound in the neck patient can also complain of the lump in the neck patient can also complain of the halitosis and the bad smell from the mouth as well so what happened in the diffuse esophageal spasm as i told you previously patient will be coming with what patient will be coming with the retrosternal chest pain and that will be started after consuming the very cold liquid or the something else that will be cold in response to the cold patient esophagus will get into the spasm this will cause the pain and this pain will get relieved by the you know gt and spray or the night you know uh, apart from this when you will do the ecg and the cardiac enzyme troponin they will come back normal so you have to keep these things guys in your mind these are the very very important things to differentiate about the dysphagia.
so if someone is coming with the fever flu like symptom right upper quadrant pain and you did the deliver you you know you examine the patient patient is also genderist as well so what you have to do you have to go for the testing and you have to take the history patient will give the history like they have taken something uh, they have taken something like the selfish or the seafood and what will happen you have to think about the hepatitis a r e when you will do the testing you will see the igm antibodies to the hepatitis a r positive and the alt ast will be you know skying high so they will be very very high as well so in this way you have to suspect about the hepatitis a infection so what happen in the hepatitis b infection so let me tell you something hepatitis b serology important points you have to memorize is so please keep in the first marker you know to be abnormal in the hepatitis b is hepatitis b surface antigen high infectivity if patient is positive with the hepatitis b envelop antigen envelop antigen mean e mean envelop and e mean eager to spread this is highly infective so indicate the recent vaccination anti hepatitis b surface antibody anti hepatitis b surface antibody is recent vaccination past infection is anti hepatitis b core antibody okay in the same way to guys you can see you can do the investigation for the hepatitis c this is the hepatitis c virus and rna and you can go for the hepatitis d it is similar to the hepatitis b and the hepatitis e is related to fecal oral route and this can happen as well as the hepatitis a virus happened so guys that's all regarding the git gastroenterology this so i am trying to make these videos to just help you people please please share these videos with your friends and with your colleagues as well if you think these videos are worth you know hearing so please keep supporting thank you very much for watching the video if you have any questions you can follow me on the instagram you can directly message me over there or you can mention your question in the comment box as well thank you very much take care bye bye